Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Leonard Leo. I uh, serve as uh, Executive Vice President of the Federalist Society, and it's a privilege for me to be here today to introduce our, our luncheon speaker, our keynote. Uh, it's also a great privilege to be here again at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library. This is such an inspiring and beautiful place, isn't it? And we are so grateful to them for, uh, for uh, uh, permitting us to be here for so many years to, uh, to host our annual Western Conference for the Federalist Society. Um, it's a privilege for me to be up here to introduce our speaker this afternoon, uh, former White House Counsel Donald McGahn, who I know many of you are uh, at least generally familiar with. Uh, and uh, he's had a very illustrious career. Uh, looking to the more recent period, you know, two U.S. Supreme Court justices, uh, nearly 40 appellate court judges, an extremely muscular agenda on regulatory reform. These are some of the very consequential aspects of former White House counsel Don McGahn's legacy. I can't recall in my professional life, at least, a White House counsel who was as directly and intensely engaged on the enterprise of judicial selection and confirmation. And I certainly cannot recall a process as bold and entrepreneurial. An unprecedented, unprecedented number of youthful nominees who will serve for two decades, a generation or more. A pipeline that began just on the heels of the inauguration of 2017, and that was unrelenting in churning out nominees quickly. Now, what led Don McGahn to such a consequential inflection point in our history? Well, first and foremost, I know that Don McGahn has been committed to an agenda of limited constitutional government for a very long time. He got involved in the Federalist Society early on in law school. In fact, he just recently showed me his, a certificate we gave him in 1993 for his service as president of his law school Federalist Society chapter. Gene, why the heck didn't I get one of those? <laughs> McGann also had just the right combination of experience to launch such a successful enterprise. His work as a lawyer, a very senior partner at Jones Day, and as an official at the Federal Election Commission, gave him great exposure to many members of the Senate, which leads to the kinds of insights and relationships that can be very helpful in facilitating the judicial confirmations process. It was unprecedented and unique experience for a White House counsel in modern history. Don also had, very importantly, the trust and confidence of Donald Trump, our president. Having served with him from early on as general counsel in the campaign, this led to an important and unusual amount of concentrated authority to manage the selection and confirmation process within the White House infrastructure. But, but, balanced by a firm understanding that it is the president who ultimately signs commissions for judges and ultimately gets the credit. And that kind of humility is a very important element of successful and um, uh, meaningful public service that Don has demonstrated. I'd venture to say that Don McGahn's tenure as White House counsel has set some new bars and standards in our country. And that should be good news for those of us who believe that judicial appointments are our president's most important and lasting legacy. So first of all, Don, we're very grateful for the service that you rendered to our country as counsel to the president, the important legacy you've established, the important mark you've left on the judiciary in cooperation with, with our president. And of course, we're also very grateful for your participation today in our Western leadership, uh, in our Western conference. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our luncheon speaker, former White House counsel Don McGahn.
Leonard, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, I feel uh, embarrassed to even speak now. There's a, I can only go one direction, and that's down after that kind introduction. Um, I want to echo what you said. It's, 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 it's such an honor and so wonderful to be at the Reagan Library, isn't it? I, uh, I've been here once before. It was during the presidential primaries. There was a presidential debate here in the Republican primaries. I didn't see any of it. We came in through the back. There were trailers in the back, and we sort of came in. I, I was working, so I didn't, I didn't realize I, I, how much there was here to see. So I look forward to spending some time this afternoon um, uh, taking it all in. Uh, I had the honor to be the counsel to the President of the United States, something I never thought I would ever get to be. Uh, I am no longer the counsel to the President of the United States, at least in official capacity. So the common question I get is, so what are you doing now? And uh, I, I remind people that actually it's been just about three months since I, since I left. Feels like three years if your name's Pat Cipollone, I'm sure, who's a wonderful guy and I think is going to do a great job uh, going forward. Um, but when one factors in the holidays, uh, the government shut down, there's only been about six working days since I left. So <laughs> not much has really changed yet. So we'll see, we'll see what happens. Um, one thing that, I, that has changed for me is I, I'm one that's never really been particularly comfortable uh, with being famous for being famous. Many people are very comfortable in that role. I was never one to really uh, insist on getting my picture taken and that sort of thing. Apparently there's a whole uh, picture racket that goes on, these, these companies that have these pictures charged for images. At one point a picture of me was worth about $5,000. Um, uh, then then uh, Brett Kavanaugh happened and then uh, my picture price really dropped. So. Uh, <laughs> So I find myself now occasionally being recognized in airports and things. It's something that, that had never happened before, uh, unless I already knew the person. I do get recognized by people who know me, obviously. I've you know, <laughs> been, been, been in Washington you know, my whole career, so you know, when I'm in D.C., people, you know, they run into me and they, they know me from various, various things I've done over the years. But I, I've had some interesting you know, experiences. I had a flight uh, a few months ago where a guy got on the plane and, and, and uh, he had on a red hat, like a Make America Great a hat, a Great Again hat, but it was in Russian. And I thought, oh boy, this is probably not a friendly. So, <laughs> so I'm sitting there, and and uh, I helped him with his gear, you know. And he was on the plane late, and he sat down, and and he kind of had on like the corduroy pants, like the hipster kind of thing going. And I thought, this is this is not going to be good. So I looked down, and he had his phone out, and he was swiping through pictures of me. And I and he kind of looked at me. I said, I said, uh, I said, yeah, it's me. And he looked, he said, I know who you are. And then I can't because C-SPAN's here and they would, they would then bleep everything he said to me. So I, it was quite an eye-opening experience to have this guy just, just you know, scream at me. Um, so I, I sort of, uh, I, you know, I, I, I pay attention now to who's around me. I, I, I got to take a family vacation first time ever. It was really wonderful. My wife and my two little boys, we went somewhere. And someone came up to me. Uh, it turns out the person who owned the place we were staying. And, and uh, uh, he asked what we did, and I sort of didn't really say, I'm a lawyer, and I kind of do political law, whatever that is. And then he came back, and he went to the bar, and he had his phone out, and he came back, and I thought, you know, I said to my wife, uh-oh, here we go, and he came, hey, hey, I know who you are. And I said, are you going to punch me? He said, no, no, I want to thank you for your service, and it was very nice, and his wife actually had served in the Reagan administration. Um, and being at the Reagan Library made me think of this fellow, because he's very nice, very gracious. And then I flew out last night out of Reagan, came in LAX, and I was in Reagan, and I, there was a couple people who, who you know, they, they didn't look Republican, okay? Um, <laughs> and uh, they, they, I could tell they sort of were doing the, you know, that's like, you know, that's like one of those, those guys. Um, and I get that sometimes. I, I, I met, I was at a, a, some social gathering, and somebody looked at me and said, you're one of those people that work in the White House. And I said, I get that all the time. I don't think I look like that guy at all. Um, <laughs> And they said, no, you're Sean Spicer. I said, no, I'm not, no, I'm not Sean Spicer. But this is at the party. So anyway, I, this is in the airport. Now, this is, this fast forward to last night. And, and these folks didn't come up to me. But, but then when we got off the plane, of all things, I'm in Los Angeles, and a couple people kind of waiting in the gate, um, you know, kind of, kind of seemed to recognize me. And they came up, and they were very nice. They started talking about all the wonderful work I've done, and it's so great, and they want to take pictures with their kids. 
And I said, okay, sure. So I'm there taking pictures and they're, they're saying to me, you know, how wonderful it is, you know, my public service and my great career. And I'm thinking, I love these people. So we get done and they said, thanks so much, Brett, for the pictures. <laughs> now, all Irishmen do not look alike. We don't, we all wear blue ties at all times. We part our hair on the wrong side, but otherwise we, I don't really see the resemblance. But anyway, I occasionally get called Brett Kavanaugh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which is, you know, kind of cool because then people, you know, think I'm a Supreme Court justice and I'm not and never will be. But uh, I've had something to do with with helping uh, uh, President Trump uh, pick two great justices. Um, people have asked me since I've left, you know, how did you do it, this, that and the other. And it's really interesting to be here at the Reagan Library because so much of what President Reagan did inspired me and my team to do what, what we did. Uh, I remember when I first moved to Washington uh, a few years after uh, I got the Federalist Society certificate, which I got framed and hung on my office. I was at a firm called Patton Boggs, which was kind of a Democrat firm. So they really loved me. I came up with the Federalist Society thing hanging on the wall. So even at a young age, I was kind of a little uh, edgy on, on, on sort of uh, wearing it on my sleeve. Uh, but I remember uh, a Federalist Society dinner uh, at the Mayflower, and I remember I didn't really know anyone, and I was kind of walking around looking for a seat at the, at the dinner, and someone pulled on my, my jacket and said, why don't you sit here, son? I sat down, and I turned, and the, and the person said, I'm, I'm Ken Cribb. And I thought, that's funny. That guy that worked for Reagan was named Ken Cribb, and I realized this is the Ken Cribb, and I was very excited. And we went around the table, and I realized right across the table from me stood up, and this, this gentleman, very nice person, could have said, I'm, I'm Ed Meese. And I thought, of, of course you are. I thought Washington, D.C. was going to be like this every night. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was not. Um, it only went downhill from there. But I was reminded by this uh, because, one, I've, I've already told this story in other Federalist Society events, but since I'm on the West Coast, I can, I can regurgitate the story. But when I came in the front door, they have the trustees, and there's Edwin Meese's name proudly displayed. And really, he's a personal hero of mine. And so much of what I did in the White House, I tried to model after what he did, uh, particularly with judicial selection. Uh, and really look back to what they did. And, and I remember when Neil Gorsuch uh, was, uh, was put on the court, uh, we invited Mr. Meese over to the White House. I went up a point to say, say hello to him, and I said, we're gonna pick up where you left off. And this was with the night that uh, Justice, then Judge, now Justice Gorsuch was nominated. And I think he didn't quite believe me. He said, you know, who are you? Well, I was the, remember the kid, you, we, we go way back. We went, <laughs> 1995. Um, uh, and uh, it really came full circle because when, uh, we, uh, uh, when, when uh, Justice Kavanaugh came in, um, you know, I, I get to kind of pick the chair. So I sit in the front row. And I had, I had uh, Mr. Meese sit next to me in the front row, and the president recognized him, which I thought was a nice sort of touch to sort of remember where we came from and what inspired us to do what we're doing. So um, it, it really adds to the, the, the magic of today for me to be able to speak here in the Reagan Library, given, given what we're talking about and where we are. And, and I'm going to try to go through what we did over the past two years and kind of do a little recap. I get to do this right now. Uh, this doesn't last forever, so I get to kind of, you know, do a little celebration in front of a friendly crowd. Uh, but more important than what we did is, is what does it really mean long term? Well, you, you know, judges are life tenure. Uh, and and uh, we know the courts, unfortunately, have become more and more prominent. I mean, I think our view is that they ought not be nearly as important as they are, uh, that it's really the elected officials elected by the people who should be making the policy decisions. But increasingly, courts have drifted over the years, over the past several decades or more, into areas that really uh, would be shocking to the founders. Um, so it is a very important thing to do judicial selection, but I am the first to say it should not nearly be as important. But one thing it's really done is uh, uh, it's made the Federalist Society a household name, which I think is a great thing. I was a member in law school. I was the president of my chapter. I did send a picture. I, I found that uh, when you have some downtime, you do things like you know clean clean the house. And I found some framed things that I had you know kind of kept in my home office. Uh, which became the nursery, so they were not on the wall, but I found the Federalist Society, you know, thing, and I, I took a picture and sent it to Leonard and said, hey, look at this. I didn't know you didn't get one. I, I could, we could white out and put your name on it, I guess. I know Gene signed it, not you. Um, uh, but I remember not long ago, uh, President Bush, you know, uh, with his judicial selection, and he, he had a number of really stellar appointments to the bench. But in the confirmation process, the Democrats would raise this idea of the Federal Society as if it was some secret handshake club somewhere, you know, uh, plotting God knows what. 
Um, I knew what we were plotting, but they did not. Um, and it really wasn't, really wasn't that bad. Rule of law, you know, quaint notions like that. Um, but now it's, it's an anomaly not to be a member. And uh, you know, I recall if someone, if someone wasn't a member, I'd wonder why a certain senator may be pushing the person or something. And, and, and it's amazing how even in a, in a short 10 year period, how much has turned around. Uh, and I really give the credit to, to President Trump. I mean, he fully embraced uh, uh, what Federalist Society has done uh, and other, and other like-minded organizations in DC. Uh, we, it was not long ago where he was a long shot presidential candidate who, who talked about in ju judicial selection and talked about the need to maybe put out a list of the kind of people he would put on the Supreme Court. It had never been done in American politics. It may never be done again. Uh, you know, maybe it was a, a, one, a one shot deal. Uh, and the other thing to keep in mind is that he didn't put out the list in the primary. It would have been easy for him to put out a list to make himself, you know, look conservative and do the kind of things that Beltway consultants would have, that he, he did never listen to. But if he did, they would have told him, you know, don't, you got to do it in the primary, but in the general, you have to change, et cetera, et cetera. We all know that usual move. The list did not go out until he was the presumptive nominee of the party. So this, this, was, this told me this was not, not going to be your typical uh, operation. Uh, and uh, it really, uh, I think, framed up an issue uh, that had really not been framed up that way before. And then now here we are, uh, and we have uh, uh, a number of folks on the bench from the Supreme Court on down who I think are fantastic. And I'm going to th go through a little bit of, of that uh, now. To frame it up, when, when, when President Trump became president, uh, there were uh, the Supreme Court vacancy, there were 17 Court of Appeals vacancies and close to 100 District Court vacancies. Uh, credit must be given to Mitch McConnell for this, uh, having, having decided not to move nominees, uh, which was consistent with historical precedent, it turns out, in certain, certain ways. But a number of vacancies occurred and he was in no rush to, to, to fill them. So uh, we had a little bit of an advantage there. When I, when I left the White House, which really wasn't that long ago, but it feels probably longer uh, in the modern age than it really is on the calendar, the um, President has appointed two Supreme Court justices, 30 courts of appeals judges, 53 district judges, five military judges, and two tax court judges. For your tax lawyers out there, something for you. Um, so that's 70 Article III nominees. Um, uh, were, uh, were, died in the Senate last year. And died doesn't, is not really the right word. They just, the Senate adjourns and then you have to renominate them so they're not, they're not dead. Uh, but they were not acted on. So when I mean, you start with the, the unprecedented number of vacancies that we inherited, we filled them and then some. So I think it was really a success story uh, that the President can be very proud of. Um, we, we announced our judges in waves. We actually had a kind of a mini PR strategy. We just didn't kind of randomly kind of throw people over to the Senate. We actually did a formal press release. We sort of did them in a certain order. We thought about how we were, in the order we were going to nominate them. There was actually a lot of thought put in as to what circuits to tackle first and, and, and the composition of those circuits, which senators would be easier to deal with, which would be harder to deal with. I'm not going to give away all the tricks here because, well, somebody may be watching uh, on C-SPAN or maybe not. but. Um, uh, you know, don't want, don't want the other team to know how to do it. But the New, the New York Times Magazine, something I never read, uh, but someone told me about, um, had this great line about our, our waves. It said, they said, the White House refers to every new batch of judicial appointee Trump selects as waves. In early June, it announced the 15th wave of judicial nominees as if they're soldiers landing on the beaches of Normandy. <laughs> Wave one was Neil Gorsuch. Pretty good wave, first press release. And uh, you know, the interesting thing about Justice Gorsuch, uh, which uh, Roger Pilon pointed this out to me, is, is he's, he is well-schooled, trained, and has studied political philosophy, went to Oxford, that sort of thing. And really, it really if you look at justices, I think, I think he is a, just a tremendous person. And uh, you know the word learned comes to mind. No one thinks of the word learned when they see me, but when you see Neil Gorsuch, you think that guy has read a lot of books. Um, and already he has become quite the prolific writer. Uh, and, you know his, the corner chambers there. He's right. Him and Justice Thomas kind of have the adjoining chambers. They've become quite the quite the sort of writing duo. Uh, and it's been it's been wonderful to see um, that happen. The second wave was Multhapar for the for the Circuit Court, and I've gotten to know him. 
a uh, wonderful guy, bright guy, and uh, you know has done done everything in life correctly. And, and so we move rather quickly. You know, we move we, the Supreme Court first week on the job, Supreme Court nominee, and move very quickly on the circuits. Um, and then wave three uh, names you may you may recognize. Uh, Amy Barrett was a Notre Dame law professor. Uh, was not a traditional pick. Certainly not part of the Indiana political culture. Number of lawyers there thought it was kind of their turn. A lot of pol politics there, and that kind of how it happens. Trump White House did it a little differently. We really started to find the best people and then kind of figured out, it was up to me to kind of figure out the Senate from there. And I think she is really going to be a star uh, on the bench uh, and has, has already turned some heads. And, she, and, you know, being a junior judge, and there's some here who President Trump have appointed, you know the feeling. You get, maybe get to write an en banc dissent once in a while, but you haven't really been there long enough to really have a body of work. But, but um, she is, she is just a wonderful person, and, and I, she's one of the ones I'm most proud of, able to sort of get that nomination through. Um, but, you know, the, the, the other wave, I mean, you go down the list, Joan Larson, uh, you know, she's going to be fantastic. Uh, and and the, the next, David Strauss. Uh, and it, this is a point where I can say, well, why does this, why does this matter? Well, you know, Judge Strauss, he was 42 years old. He clerked for Clarence Thomas, whip smart. Um, had a rough confirmation. Uh, they went after him. Anybody that was on the Supreme Court list, and he was because he, he was on the state Supreme Court, they, the hearings were rough because they assumed anybody that was being put on the circuit court could someday go to the highest court. So the hearings took on a, a, an urgency that you didn't typically see in the past. But he's already made his mark, and I would, I'd recommend that you read his dissent in Calzone versus Summers. This is a lobbying disclosure case on whether or not the the law could be justified under whatever standard of review the court decided to use. And we know the standards of review tend to be, you know, kind of the whole shooting match. And, and uh, uh, it's, it's really worth the read. He's already made an impact. Now, it's a dissent, but, you know, we know dissents can someday become majorities when they, when they go upstairs. So it's one of these opinions that if you're looking for, for good reads as to, as to as the kind of caliber of judges that President Trump's put on the bench, I would take a look at this opinion by Strauss. Kevin Newsom was in this wave. wave. Morrissey uh, uh, versus U.S., it's a tax case, uh, but it has to do with uh, a same-sex couple and their ability to take tax deductions. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's quite a tour de force on how to read statutes, regs, and that sort of thing. So it's a, it's a, it's a well-reasoned opinion and it, very impressive from Kevin Newsom down in the 11th Circuit. John Bush in the 6th Circuit. 6th Circuit's an interesting circuit because um, we've had um, uh, Amul Thapar, John Bash, and uh, Judge N N Nelbandian uh, the, all tied to Kentucky, which is, of course is the state of Mitch McConnell. So he, you know, it was always, always on the ball, and he's managed to really help us uh, change the Sixth Circuit for, I think, the better. Turner versus U.S. opinion, concurrence he wrote there. Really an amazing opinion on the original meaning of the Sixth, uh, Sixth Amendment. Uh, he really spent a lot of time uh, uh, going through the details there. Our fourth wave, Alice and I in Colorado. Uh, rumor is she may be here. If you're here, hello. Uh, if not, I just embarrassed myself on, on TV. Uh, clerk for Justice Thomas was on the Supreme Court list. Is, it replaced Neil Gorsuch. Big shoes to fill, and intellectually, she certainly is going to do it. I think, I think we're, very, we're very proud to have, I'm very proud to have anything to do with her in any way, shape, or form. Um, wave four also was Ralph Erickson up in uh, the Eighth Circuit for North, tied to North Dakota. Um, I, I was impressed with this with, with Ralph Erickson when I, I read when he was a district court judge, he dismissed a 50-page complaint filed by the CFPB, uh, and, and uh, it, was a, it, was, it was quite a tour de force, and I read the opinion, I said, that's my kind of guy. Um, and, uh, you know, he's on the Eighth Circuit now. Uh, judge Bevis uh, on the Third Circuit, uh, uh, Association of uh, New Jersey Rifle, uh, clubs versus New Jersey. It's a gun case. Uh, New Jersey passed a law about how many bullets you can have in the magazine. Uh, it, is, it is a very well, very long, and very originalist opinion on the Second Amendment. It's unfortunately a dissent, but it's something that you see right out of the gate. Trump's appointed judges are not being shy. They are actually writing, you know, very, very well-reasoned opinions going back to first principles. Um, the next way we did was all district judges. They count, but you know, time-wise, let me keep let me keep moving to the exciting stuff. Uh, the sixth wave, Steve 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 Gratz from Nebraska uh, is going to be great. He, um, you know, he took some punches in his confirmation hearing, but I think he's uh, 
he's, he's going to be a star. Mike Brennan, Seventh Circuit, fellow Notre Dame alum, so I kind of gravitate. In addition to Thomas Clerks, so I look for Notre Dame alert, alums. Tom Hardiman's another Notre Dame alum. Um, the Church of uh, Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ versus the uh, city of, of, of Markham, Illinois. This was a, a permitting case for a church. A person, a, a minister had a house that he converted to a church, and he got he caught up in the local bureaucracy, something that uh, you know, the deregulation efforts of President Trump are another success story that doesn't really quite get the, uh, the, the ink that it deserves. I think that's more something history will reflect back on as something that's important. But this is an opinion worth reading that uh, shows, uh, and this is a majority opinion. This is now, this is not some dissent. This is, this is Brennan writing for the court. Uh, and it's really just an it's really a, a, a great example of somebody who gets into the weeds, uh, you know, reads the regs, gets into the, what was actually in the briefs. You know, it wasn't one of these opinions. It was summary judgment below. He didn't just say, ah, you know, it's probably right. Um, so I could keep going through everybody in detail, but I'm going to try to wrap it up a little bit because I am going to take a couple questions when I get done. Uh, Lisa Branch down in the 11th Circuit of Georgia is, is I think, really going to be a strong, a, a strong judge. Um, uh, she wasn't expected to get the seat among, you know, the Georgia, every state has their kind of hierarchy. There's, a, there's always the gang who thinks that they should get it, and she was not in that mold, which made it all the more exciting to put her on the bench. And then also she was nominated at the same time Greg Katzis was nominated, uh, who has been my law partner at Jones Day, my deputy White House counsel. Um, and uh, uh, I'll give a speech uh, someday on how Greg Katzis got on the bench, but there wasn't much of an interview process. Um, uh, he is, uh, you know, it's, un it's unfortunate that uh, he'll probably be writing a lot of dissents. The good news there is it gives, it gives the people at the Supreme Court something to read uh, uh, and helps them decide what cases are worth reviewing. Um, the next wave is, uh, is really where we made a move on the Fifth Circuit. And, uh, you know, the, it, 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 Kyle Duncan uh, out of Louisiana is, had a, a fantastic appellate career. Um, uh, Kurt Engelhart, uh, also out of Louisiana, a great district judge and very bright, very bright person. Um, uh, Don Willett out of Texas um, was somewhat, someone who was on the Supreme Court list, had a, also had a, had a flair for, for using Twitter, um, uh, which I, I respected. I've gotten to know him, and I, I think he is, he is a, a wonderful a wonderful judge, wonderful person. Reason Magazine, um, which I actually got when I was a chairman of the Federal Election Commission, which kind of threw him for a curve, and then also got it in the White House Counsel's Office, which really confused people. Um, and it, this happens to be the one with Kanye West on the cover, uh, which is not why I'm holding it up. But they actually have a nice article on, uh, on Willett. Um, and it's, it's called Liberty Has a New Champion on the Federal Bench. And it's, it's a nice summary of the opinions he's, he's, he's written and, and that you actually have a libertarian now on the Fifth Circuit. Uh, so I think uh, you, you read this article, he's had a number of opinions where he's, he's stuck his neck out already. Jim Ho on the Fifth Circuit uh, was uh, 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 clerked for Clarence Thomas. Out of the gate, uh, and I meant to bring his opinion, and I have it on my phone, but I'm not going to dig through it. He quotes Clarence Thomas in his first paragraph. As a, as, a, as a Fifth Circuit judge, his first move out of the gate is quoting Clarence Thomas, uh, which tells you uh, we picked the right guy there. Um, it was a campaign finance case, which both me and Senator McConnell thought we, we picked the right guy there. Uh, and he struck a contribution limit, and it really is a, it's just a, it's, it's, as someone who is, is, is a campaign junkie and was a campaign finance expert, and I guess probably I still am a campaign finance expert, I read it and, and I thought it was one of the best opinions I've ever read on the, on the, on the, in the subject. And that's including Citizens United or McCutcheon or any of the, any of the, the seminal cases. So, you know, Jim Howe is, is, is really making his mark. Um, the same is true of so many others. Um, the uh, next thing I want to try to talk about a little bit is uh, where do we go from here? Um, what's the future look like? Well, Supreme Court's taken the case Kaiser versus Wilkie, uh, talking about our deference. Um, and for people uh, who don't know it, it's AU. ER, it's not H-O-U-R, it's, it's a case. Uh, I'm doing this because people may watch this tape and don't know what I'm talking about. It's a doctrine where courts defer uh, to an agency's reading of its own regulations. Seems odd to a first year law student because you learn in contracts class that a, a, a vague term or, or, or we have a dispute over language, it, it, you construe it against the drafter. Unless you're the, friendly, unless you're the friendly government, then the tie goes in favor of the friendly regulator. Seems kind of backwards. Um, 
when it comes to deregulation, uh, one goal we had was not merely to play the uh, alphabet soup game of, of, of new regulations versus old regulations. We've thought through how to really make a systemic change and spent a lot of time thinking about Chevron, Hour, and these sorts of things. So this is going to be an interesting case to watch. It'll be interesting to see how the Department of Justice briefs the case. Are they going to defend Hour? Are they not going to defend Hour? If I were still there, I know what I would say to do. Um, so we'll see what happens there. But that is one to watch. Um, the next thing to watch is, is the Ninth Circuit. Um, Ninth Circuit, uh, sitting in California, most of you, if not all of you, are, are very familiar with the Ninth Circuit and how it works. Uh, it's, a, it's a different kind of place. Uh, it's an often reversed kind of place. Um, but uh, the President nominated, a, 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 in, it, we had a number of vacancies on the Ninth Circuit. Um, and it's, uh, there's 29 active seats on the Ninth Circuit. There's six current vacancies. Uh, of the 23 active, and I hate to play partisan politics with judges because, you know, sometimes merely because a Republican appointed you or a Democrat appointed you doesn't really say what you're going to be. But for shorthanding, let me just, if you could forgive me just to talk about who appointed. 16 Democrat appointments, seven Republican appointments. This includes Judge Bennett, who uh, came out of Hawaii, uh, and Judge Nelson out of Idaho, uh, both appointed by President Trump. Uh, so it's a sort of, a, you know, to do sort of the back of the envelope, a 16 to 7 uh, court. Um, there are six other vacancies. The president did nominate people for all vacancies. Uh, one, which we know about, uh, Ryan Bounds, fantastic guy, uh, uh, prosecutor, uh, brilliant lawyer, uh, didn't get through the Senate, uh, 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 which was unfortunate and uh, was, was very painful to go through. And, and that was an opportunity, I think, I think missed. Uh, because that would have been a 16 to 8 court. Um, uh, Bridget Beatty out of Arizona uh, and uh, Mr. Miller out of uh, Washington have been nominated. Uh, both will be great when they get there. I predict they will get through the Senate. Uh, and so you see we're sort of closing, closing the gap. Um, the President had nominated three folks uh, tied to California. California is a unique bird because, well, the ranking member of the committee uh, is from uh, a jurisdiction over judges is from California, so it's a little bit of an interesting dance. But if you look at the three people the president nominated, you really can't find three better people. Um, Collins uh, is among her tolls, and he is uh, 30, at least at least when I, on my talking points, at least 36 arguments uh, before the Ninth Circuit alone. Dan, you may have had a couple since I don't know, uh, but uh, he was a former assistant U.S. attorney, he worked in the office of legal counsel. Uh, clerk for Justice Scalia, you simply can't challenge him uh, uh, on his credentials or his ability. Uh, Mr. Lee is a Jenner and Block, been nominated, uh, worked in the uh, President Bush's White House Counsel's Office. Uh, he clerked at the Fifth Circuit. He went to Cornell undergrad, JD at Harvard, magna cum laude, yeah, not dumb. Um, and then uh, Mr. Bumate, a real star, I got to know him a little bit because he helped with various confirmation uh, fights. Uh, he's this currently assistant U.S. attorney out here on the West Coast. He's been he's uh, sort of detailed to Maine Justice. Um, he uh, clerked for Judge. Uh, 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 he clerked on the Tenth Circuit. Went to Yale undergrad, Harvard, JD. He's a member of the National uh, Filipino uh, Lawyers Association, and he's also in the Tom Homan LBG uh, LGBT Law Association. So, oftentimes I'd meet with senators, and they'd say. Where's the diversity of your nominees? Where's this? Where's that? This is, pre he is precisely what the Democrats said a Republican president would never nominate, but this president did. And I think President Trump should be given a lot of credit for that. Um, the, the White House has renominated a bunch of judges. They have not renominated these, uh, the slate of California judges. I, I don't have any firsthand knowledge as to why. I'm hoping it's to try to work with the senators and, and, and make confirmation smoother. So I really hope that they stick with this ticket that the, that the president has already signed off on. Um, assuming, assuming this all works out, let's, we have 16 Democrat appointees, seven Republican appointees. If we can get the other six confirmed, seven plus six is 13, which makes the Ninth Circuit a 16 to 13 court. And the way California, uh, given the geographic size of California uh, with Hawaii, and how, how much travel is involved. The en banc system is a little bit different, as we all know, uh, out here, where it's not the full court, it's a subset of the court. So one could imagine uh, how important it could be to fill these vacancies. Uh, you know, you're not necessarily going to uh, 
uh, win every case, but at least I think you get more of a fighting chance and probably, probably have a more balanced panel, which when I look to the Ninth Circuit, my theme had always been we need to restore a little bit more balance. Um, even how judges are picked, there's a kind of a commission and that kind of thing, that's rather new. I learned from Justice Kennedy actually that there used to be more of a deal where the White House would pick some, the senators would pick some, which is true in other states, uh, but California has become its own kind of thing. So I hope the White House is able to kind of stick with it uh, and get it done because I think it can really make a difference uh, not only in the long term, but in the short term. I mean, right now, everyone who wants to challenge anything President Trump does runs to some, someone in the Ninth Circuit knowing that uh, uh, they, they have like-minded judges there uh, and, uh, you know, there's a, the Supreme Court can't hear them all. Think. So with that, let me, let me uh, cease speaking and uh, take a few questions. And just as a, as a final thing, thank everyone for your attention. Thank the Federalist Society for all the work you've done. Um, I used to bristle, and I still do, when the Democrats would say that President Trump outsourced his judicial selection to the Federalist Society. We didn't outsource it. We insourced it. Everybody in, that worked for me in the White House Counsel's Office was a member of the Federalist Society. It, it, it's, 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 it's not as if, you know, we view the Federalist Society as some interest group that we would check off a box, you know, a list of like, well, what does this group think and what does that group think and what does this group think? I am you, you are me, and I think it was a very successful run. And my final is just to personally thank Leonard, uh, who I knew before, really know now, for his friendship, support, uh, leadership of this organization, not to diminish Jim G. Meyer's ultimate leadership and everyone else involved, but Leonard, um, uh, I remember bringing Leonard over to my law firm when, when then candidate Trump came into town and, and introduced them and they really hit it off and, and uh, it's, it's really, it helped me because I could have a great sounding board and you know, when it, President Trump wanted to make sure uh, he knew what he was getting with his judges, and I, 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 we did a lot of due diligence, and without Leonard's help, and so many here, really, I look around the room, so many of you helped, uh, because we would really check on, on who clerked for who, and who was co-clerks, and what did the co-clerks say about the person. We really tried to get a sense of who someone was. But without Leonard, uh, you know, none of this really would have been possible. So with that, uh, I will turn it over to Leonard to orchestrate who's gonna ask questions. So, some questions? Yeah. yeah. So, so what we're gonna do is, um, we have, uh, if you have a question, uh, raise your hand and our staff and volunteers will bring the mic to you. First, I want to thank you and thank President Trump for your work. My name is Thomas Lane. I'm a second year law student at Arizona State University. Besides coming to conferences like these, what can we do as individuals once we go home to continue your legacy? Sorry, what was the first part after the thank yous? <laughs> My question was, what can we do as individuals once we leave this conference and go back to our everyday lives? What, what, what can we do to continue your legacy? Well, let me stop you. I don't, I don't have a legacy. President Trump has the legacy, okay? He signs the commission, I mean, he's the president, and I was honored to be a part of it. But I, I say this because it's important to keep in mind who runs the country. The elected officials are elected by the people, they're the ones that run the country. So one thing you can take home is trying to hold bureaucracies and unelected people accountable, and, and your elected officials accountable uh, for their actions, and, and, and always keep in mind who runs the place. I, I really love the question because I remember when I was young, I would go listen to speeches and then try to take things. And, and I, I never, I'm basically the person giving the speech probably never knew the impact. Um, and I remember being a young guy when I moved to DC, actually at a Federalist Society convention and hearing Roger Pilon speak. And he didn't know me then and he's gotten to know me now and, and, and he's touched many, many people. Um, and uh, I remember coming to DC as kind of a hybrid conservative libertarian who instinctively kind of thought he understood the world but couldn't quite put the gloss on it. And, and to see someone like Roger who, who, who spoke of all the constitutional amendments as, as, as if they mattered, the first and the second and, well, the third, okay, but the fourth, fifth, and sixth. You know, right of center, not everybody really talks about the fourth, fifth, and sixth with the same gusto they speak about the ninth and tenth, right? So my, my point is, is, is what you can do is maybe I said something here today that, that will resonate with you or someone else. 
But when you, when, you get, when you get out and you practice law, keep coming to this kind of thing. That's what you can do. And if someday you end up as lucky as I did and you get to give these speeches, give speeches at law schools, go places where you might be able to t talk to the younger generation. So I think what I don't, I can't give you anything to go do today to carry on. But the way to carry it on is if you get the chance to do something, do it. And, and don't be afraid to speak to student groups because 99 out of 100 students may be texting or not listening, but there may be one kid sitting there like I was listening to Roger who says, you know what, that's something, you know, it gave me an idea that crystallized something that really resulted in so much of how I view the world. So that's, you know, if you want to talk legacy, it's not my legacy, it's your legacy. They're getting the microphones in position. There we go. Thank you. I, you expressed you know, uncertainty over whether the list would be you know, an ongoing feature of, uh, of you know, either this White House or future White Houses. It, to a certain extent, though, at least observing it, some of us have the sense that, that the use of that list has become kind of a, like a no new taxes pledge. And I'd be interested in your thoughts on whether that's become something that is simply going to be politically important, if not necessary, for all Republican candidates to use in some form or another going forward. You know, time will tell. I mean, when you say the no new taxes pledge, I think of the 92 election. Um, and the difference there is President Trump actually didn't break his pledge. He delivered on everything he said when it came to judges. So. Uh, uh, but I think I take what you say is that now it's become sort of a standard thing for, you know, these like, tax pledges that people sign and, you know, from the House candidates to governors to everybody on it, it becomes a standard kind of thing. I, you know, it would be wonderful if it did be, become a standard kind of thing where people actually, if, it, if they have the power to appoint judges, what kind of judges they're going to appoint. And actually it becomes an issue that the people can hear about and decide. Uh, and I think, I think it'd be great. I'm not sure it really happens. There are various political consultants who sort of, feed at the trough of the political industrial complex in D.C. who think it's going to be a necessary thing going forward. I've heard from Democratic consultants, they feel they need their own list, that sort of thing. Maybe, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't work. I think Donald Trump is unique uh, with respect to this. I think that he, uh, he, had a, he has a certain kind of courage and boldness that you're just not going to see. You haven't seen before, you're not going to see it again. He comes from a completely different place than really anyone else who, who has run for for high office, particularly the presidency. So I'm not sure people can simply replicate what he did. I think historically, you gotta look at the context in which it happened. Uh, you know, we all, we all remember uh, where we were when we learned Justice Scalia passed. So there was a very real need uh, there. Um, maybe, maybe that happens again where, that is, it, where there's a vacancy. It's happened in history before, but the, in, the, in the modern age of, of sort of mass communication, that, that, that was something that really caused the proverbial planets to line up. I'm sure there'll be political consultants who will say you need a list. And uh, look, for purposes of if you're trying to do a campaign or help and you want to write a white paper and you think it's, I'm not going to get in the way of that. I mean, you know, it's, it's a good way to get, get more thinking people involved in sort of campaigns. But um, I, I think in many ways President Trump broke the mold and it's not something that other people can simply do. They can try. But I have heard from consultants that they think they have to have lists and that kind of thing. And I think, uh, you know, long term, that's going to be good. If the candidates are forced to talk about the judicial branch and its role, I think that's going to be healthy. Because I think once we talk about it, our views are going to make a lot more sense to ordinary Americans. I think I'll be more convinced of uh, Donald Trump's commitment to diversity when he appoints a Protestant to the Supreme Court. Um, my qu but Neil was raised Catholic. <laughs> a Protestant. <laughs> um, you know, watching the Kavanaugh hearings, um, I was returning to the bookshelf to read Judge Bork's Tempting of America and uh, Justice Thomas's My Grandfather's Son. And both of them have chapters in those books that describe what the Democrats did to try to derail their nominations. It's very clear their game plan was known. So my question really is, were we prepared for that? And if we were, why did that 
crazy month happen? We certainly were prepared. That's why he's on the Supreme Court. Um, <laughs> it was inevitable they were going to come after whoever was nominated by any means necessary. Uh, filling the shoes of Justice Scalia is impossible, um, which is why I think Justice Gorsuch years from now is going to be his own Gorsuch is going to be a shorthand for his, his style of thinking and judging. Um, but the, con the conventional wisdom was that was sort of a trade, like, like trade for like trade. You weren't affecting the balance of the court, so to speak. Justice Kennedy retires from the court, still a judge, can still ride the circuit. I want to be clear, you know, he didn't retire from being a judge. And, you know, the left and the media and others are going to say, well, this is the swing seat, the big myth of the swing seat. I remember when Citizens United was before the court, all the articles about the swing seat of Justice Kennedy. He's the strongest First Amendment guy we've had, you know, ever. So, but that doesn't mean perception doesn't become reality. So we knew, we knew they're going to go after it guns a blazing. Um, and uh, we were prepared, and that's why we had a, an operation to, to push back. And a lot of this comes from lessons learned from Bork and Thomas. I was, uh, I was in high school at the time of the Bork hearings. Uh, I watched some of them. My, my father taped them on a, a VHS player and, and made me watch them, and it was fascinating because I, I was inspired and it made me go to law school. Um, and then I was in law school when the Thomas hearings hit, and I watched them intently. Uh, interestingly, Brett Kavanaugh was a first year law student when the Bork hearings happened and then had gotten, just gotten out of law school in Thomas. So both of us, people are at my age, I'm 50, you know, my age, came of age in those hearings. So we studied them intently uh, and we really paid attention to what happened and I think we took a lot of lessons learned and we were very much prepared from how we sort of launched it to how we, 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 we did it. It's unfortunate that modern Supreme Court nominations are essentially run like political campaigns, but that's, that's what it's become. And, and these were run in a, very, you know, in a very strong way, which is why you know, we have the, the success that we've had. It was inevitable that they were gonna come after whoever was up on something. It just was gonna be tough to predict. But uh, we weathered the storm and, and uh, survived. Previous generations may not have survived because they may not have seen it coming. We're gonna take one more question. When it comes to the number of judges, I think something that impresses so many of us is the commitment to get them through in the face of a lot of obstinance on the other side. What is one change that you think could be done in the next two years to help speed that process along and make it something that works better and allows good people to get on the court like Pat Bumente? There was a time where the Senate would um, move judicial nominees and defer to other senators. This is kind of where this blue slip courtesy comes from. Home state senators would have a big say in district court judges. That morphed into sort of circuit courts, and it's odd because circuit courts actually sit for multiple states. So it's not clear to me why, you know, senators in state X get to really decide the judges that sit for multiple states. And the statute requires, you know, citizenship residency of, of each state on the circuits. But once you get the sort of minimal statutory thing, I'm, it's not clear to me why the Senate maintains this. Um, but what's happened now is the Senate uses every trick in its book to slow this down. Uh, and it, it, it is something that's built up over the years on both sides of the aisle. Um, the questionnaires nominees have to fill out. Not only do they have to fill out the form for the FBI background that the president uh, likes to make sure happens before it makes a nomination. But then there's a whole separate questionnaire that the Senate requires uh, that takes forever and a day. And then there's follow-up questions. And it, it, the, the, it, it takes a long time to get a hearing. And then you have to prep for the hearing. Then there's the hearing. Then there's follow-up questions off the hearing. Then, it, <clears throat> then there's a separate vote to get it out of committee. Then it gets out of committee. It goes to the Senate floor. But then they have debate. Then they have to get what's called cloture. And then there's this 30-hour rule. And the Democrats have been very good over the past two years of running the clock to the maximum extent possible. That's not how it used to be. It used to be that senators kind of had their deals with the White House and they would kind of work together and there would at least be some 
judges that would go through on unanimous consent or not this full thing. So I'm not sure what the, what the actual magic change is other than the Senate has really uh, gotten into the habit of taking a lot of time all the time on these sorts of things. Um, and it's, you know, it's kind of unfortunate. One, one thing that we did in the White House to try to counteract that was consult with the senators extensively before the nomination was made and see how much we can get buttoned up before we launched a nomination to take away the argument that they needed more time and all that kind of thing. And it kind of helped. I mean, part of why we were able to get so much done the past two years is we didn't really hesitate. We moved, we moved quickly. Um, you know, it, it, the Senate has grown into, into its own sort of precedence and, and that sort of thing, and you'd kind of fundamentally alter it uh, in some ways. But, you know, uh, Senator Hatch gave a great speech at Heritage uh, late last year about his experience in the Senate and how it evolved uh, and how contentious it became. Uh, and, you know, the really, the, the, the blowing up the, the, is what they call the nuclear option, blowing up the filibuster on, on circuit noms to load up the D.C. circuit was really a, a, new, a new move. Could the Republicans counter and do a similar thing with circuit nom? Maybe. I don't know. Eliminating the filibuster was something that shouldn't have, shouldn't have had to be done. Let's not forget uh, Clarence Thomas's vote total was quite tight, but yet he got, he got a, final, a vote on final passage. I mean, if the Senate could commit on at least giving presidential nominees an up or down vote, that would be nice. I think the president's entitled to that. And this is really regardless of who's in the White House and who's in the Senate. And I, finally, it's the, the, nom it, it, the nominees are owed a vote. Many of you are on the bench or potentially are going to be on the bench. You've been through this. I mean, it's amazing what you give up, the number of questions you have to answer, the detail that you have to tell people. The idea is just you have to sit down with me and tell me, you know, things you haven't told anybody else is kind of, kind of weird. Um, and, and, you know, for what? So we can just take more time? I don't know. It's the time that I think needs to be compressed. And I don't really have a good solution. I'm thinking about some ideas. I may write something on that, but it's, uh, it's tricky. So with that, I think, uh, I think our time is up. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's been an honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you.